This week, reporter Richard Gear tracks down Julia Roberts for a story on the runaway bride. A little boy finds a friend in the Iron Giant. And Samuel L. Jackson races to keep super smart killer sharks from heading into the deep blue sea. Hey, you're that reporter, right? Yeah. There he is again. Snoop Doggy Dog. Richard Gere is a newspaper columnist on the trail of Julia Roberts in Runaway Bride. It's one of five new movies we'll review this week. I'm Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times, and across the aisle from me is this week's guest critic. And I am Joyce Kohaywick, film critic for WBZ-TV in Boston, and it is great to be here, Roger. I knew it would come to this. <laughs> yes, you are my Oscar buddy. We stand next to each other on the red carpet and harass the stars right. as they go into You're the Academy the one in the tux. Awards. <laughs> That's right. Okay, our first movie is Runaway Bride, reuniting after nine years the director and the co-stars of Pretty Woman. But this is a pale shadow of Gary Marshall's wonderful 1990 film. Oh, Richard Gere stars as a newspaper columnist who writes a reckless woman-bashing column based on a story told to him by a drunk in a bar about a Maryland woman who has stranded, he says, seven or eight would-be husbands at the altar. The bride, played by Julia Roberts, is outraged. She only stood up three guys. She writes a letter to the editor claiming 15 factual errors. Okay, listen, listen, it's in the paper. Okay, come on, try this on first. Okay. All right. I don't want to read it to you, so come over this way. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Dear Maggie Carpenter, I apologize to you for this unfortunate matter. Here it is. Um, I, Graham's column will no longer be appearing in this paper. Best of luck in your upcoming marriage. Hey, okay, this is the weight of the pack you'll be carrying in the Himalayas. Okay. You let me know if it's too heavy. Okay. We'll just... Whoa! Ah! Gear travels to her impossibly folksy small town to get the real story, and the movie's cutesy tone is demonstrated here in the way she lurks under a barber chair. Who are these lovely ladies? Hi, I'm Cindy, Maggie's unmarried cousin. Hello. Mrs. Pressman, no relation. Oh. Uh -huh. And you are? Looking for Maggie. It's inevitable that these two become attracted to one another, although at first, of course, they have to be antagonistic. Excuse me. Oh, look at that. Bam, 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 bam. Oh, 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 help me, help me. Yep, that'd be her. Runaway Bride is so cornball and cutesy poo that you want to squirm while you're watching no. this movie. And all during the movie, I kept remembering Roberts in Notting Hill, where she plays a star who was trying to escape from characters <laughs> just like the one she plays here. Runaway Bride. Could have been made 40 years ago with Doris Day and Rock Hudson, and it probably would have been a lot more fun mm -hmm. because they had the style for silly movies like this, and Roberts and Gear look miscast and misused. I couldn't agree more. And in fact, you used the word that I felt while I was watching this movie, mm -hmm. squirm. Mm -hmm. I was physically uncomfortable. It was so cornball. Mm -hmm. And it, it isn't that we don't know where this is headed. I mean, we know that they're destined to... We know to, exactly, exactly where it's headed, yeah. But that can still be interesting if there are enough hurdles for them to mm -hmm. overcome. I think that the relationship needed to be threatened in some way. They needed to introduce a, another character, like a third party. And, you know, she's got a boyfriend. Oh, but he's, he hardly he's, counts as no, a third party. He's such he an just, obvious lunk that, you know, you can dismiss yeah. him he's immediately. He's just benevolent. He just stands there and lets everything happen to him. And all right. the people in this town are like refugees from Pleasantville, exactly. from the black and white part of Pleasantville before the color got into their world. I didn't buy that small town for a moment. No, no. Remember the luau scene where, where yeah, they're giving uh, the go-away party for the bride and it looks like a Hollywood set. This is one of those... It should like a, look like a town hall with cray paper. One of these small towns where everybody in town knows each other and they all live in each other's pockets. Exactly. Well, so we're in agreement on Runaway Bride. I'm predicting that when audiences see this, we're going to have runaway audiences. <laughs> <laughs> Our next movie is a full-length animated feature from acclaimed writer-director Brad Bird of The Simpsons fame. It's based on a children's book by British poet laureate Ted Hughes. The Iron Giant tells the story of a friendship between a young boy and a giant robot. It's set in the late 50s in the small town of Rockwell, Maine, where nine-year-old Hogarth lives with his single mom, a waitress at the local diner. Eli Marienthal voices Hogarth. You were going to get your pet, honey? I will, Mom, right after I finish talking with... Dean. Dean. <laughs> Found your pet. Where? It's on my leg, man. Squirrel's in my pants, Hogarth. I'm trying to get the wig out of here. Don't wig out. 
And that was Jennifer you know what, Aniston as the mother and Harry Connick Jr. as Are Dean you? the Beatnik. Like and as the voices and animation live. suggest, Rockwell is as wholesome and normal as its name implies, but it is also filled with detailed, offbeat characters, and none more so than a 50-foot metal-munching robot from outer space who finds a friend in Hogarth. <laughs> Hogarth immediately recognizes the Iron Giant's humanity and attempts to protect him from an evil federal agent who's trying to destroy him. Strange, he's so tight-lipped now, and the other night he couldn't stop talking. I mean, 100-foot robots and whatnot. A uh, 100-foot robot? <laughs> That's nutty. <laughs> the film is crisply drawn, sweet without being naive, and it is hip and funny as well. I like what this movie is saying, that people are different and quirky, which is to be respected and valued, that we have choices about who we are, and that the imagination is a powerful tool. None of this is heavy-handed. All of these themes are embedded in a story of friendship that is emotionally satisfying, and it's fun. This is one film that I can recommend for the whole family. And boy, so can I, too. I am a real fan of animation that tries to move in new directions. I love the Disney traditional animated films, but I also like a film like this, which is really telling a story. No little sidekicks, no little songs, no little dancing teacups. This is a story of a boy and this iron giant who is kind of like E.T. in a way, and that mm -hmm. it's his secret. In fact, they reference E.T. with yeah, the they finger do. at a certain point the, the, where they touch. Yeah, and where he's kind of scurrying around, the hand is scurrying around the house yeah. and trying to stay out of the way of the... I thought that this film gave a lot of things for people to talk about afterwards, involving uh, destruction and violence and war and the Iron Giant learning right. that even though he has these weapons, it's not right for him to use them. My one little issue at the end of the film was that I was thinking, gee, is this anti-violence message coming on a little bit too strong mm -hmm. here? And I, you know, when I really stepped back, I realized it was wholly in keeping with the rest of the cartoon, and it was really subsumed in that larger story about the power yeah. of the imagination. Right. Coming up later in the show, Samuel L. Jackson is a shark fighter in Deep Blue Sea. Coming up next, two brothers who share everything are intrigued by the same woman in Twin Falls, Idaho. Francis Falls? Hello. I'm Francis. She's broke and desperate and has resorted to prostitution, but her call to a seedy hotel opens up a much different world. In that scene from the brilliant new film, Twin Falls, Idaho, Michelle Hicks is the desperate young woman, and identical twins Michael and Mark Polish play Siamese twins. They've called her, hoping for what may be their first sexual experience, but she runs away, only to return with her friend, a doctor, oh. when she finds out one of the twins is ill. Get them some proper food. What are they? That's the rarely seen but always intriguing actor Patrick Bouchot there as the doctor. As the sick twin named Francis slowly recovers, she becomes friends with the dominant twin named Blake. Why are you two here? I came here to visit a relative. But how come you don't get sick? Who take care of Francis? One thing about having three legs, there's one night of the year when you don't look out of place. There's another couple years, and they're just like Siamese, but they don't look anything like you two. Look, they're over there. The movie was written by its stars, Mark and Michael Polish, and directed by Michael Polish. You can almost guess right away when a movie is going to be really good. Twin Falls, Idaho struck me like House of Games in the company of men, Fargo, or Happiness. It's powerful, original work. The idea of Siamese twins is not handled as a gimmick, but as a way to explore how these two men have developed a love, a mutual dependence that is almost inspiring. And like all good fiction, the movie involves change. As she gets to know them better and understand them, the young woman learns a lot about her own life. Twin Falls, Idaho isn't all serious, though. It's funny, sardonic, and ironic, too. And I think 
it's one of the year's best films. Boy, I, I couldn't nope. disagree with you more. You know, I recognize this as a very worthy film, mm -hmm. but delicate. It's too delicate. And I didn't think that that it did open up those themes of interdependence and intimacy. I mean, I think what we get from the film is that it's tough to be conjoined twins, and that sometimes they want to be separate. But, you know, I could have guessed that. I, I also wanted to know more about them literally. How did they get to this hotel room? How do they make a living? Who makes their clothes? Well, I, I wanted to literally know that stuff. I don't want to know that stuff. I want to know that they're there, that they've had a backstory that we don't need to have. That would all be conventional stuff. And when you say it's delicate, well, it is delicate. It's kind of quiet sometimes. Secrets are revealed slowly. It isn't all just punch, punch, punch there out the plot. Very little it I reveals that was, as it goes along. No, I thought it was very little that was revealing. And I really? thought one of the things that really made this look like a novice effort to me, and a sincere effort, and an original effort, but a novice effort, was some of the hokey symbolism in the beginning. I mean, let's just start with the title. I bought it. I bought it. I, I went with it. I was interested in it. I was intrigued. No, I didn't, it didn't give me enough. I think they've got a long way to go. This is a nice beginning, but it is hardly a brilliant film. Okay. Coming up next, only metal walls and plate glass separate Samuel L. Jackson from some deadly sharks and the deep blue sea. Bad dreams? Would very well be. That's Thomas Jane as Carter, a shark wrangler with a prison record, in a scene from our next film, another one of those don't tamper with nature or it will come back to bite you movies. It's called Deep Blue Sea, directed by Rennie Harlan, and from its opening scene, the film references the high watermark for all movies of this genre, Jaws, as a group of kids partying on board a sailboat gradually realize they're not alone. You guys hear that? What is that? The intruder is one of three angry, souped-up Mako sharks who've escaped from a floating laboratory where a team of scientists led by the gorgeous Dr. Susan McAllister, played by Saffron Burroughs, has been experimenting on their brains. Hmm, what could go wrong there? Tell me I didn't see that. They recognize that gun. It's impossible. Sharks do not swim backwards. They can't. Samuel L. Jackson is on board as the project's financial backer and is saddled with the film's worst lines. What does an 8,000-pound Mako shark with a brain the size of a flathead V8 engine and no natural predators think about? I'm not waiting around here to find out. Unlike Jaws, with its one terrifying and largely unseen shark, here there are three, a combination of animatronics, digital effects, and footage of real sharks, and it is scary. Is it artful? No. It doesn't engage us in the deep way that Jaws shakes us down to our unconscious. Still, while Deep Blue Sea may be superficial, it does take us on an underwater adventure that's good for a few genuine thrills. I'm in complete agreement with you here. This movie does not distinguish its genre or escape from its genre, but it respects its genre, and it works as a summer thriller, which is exactly what it is. Right. There isn't a lot of character development. There's not a lot of common sense, because after all, even if a shark did have a brain that was five times as large, it wouldn't know anymore until it had learned it. I mean, you need experience <laughs> and information in order to know how this deep sea uh, station works. And these sharks just figure it out by osmosis, right. I guess. I think one of the other reasons I really was engaged was because I knew what was happening every step along the way in the action. I think that Rennie Harlan could give Joel Schumacher a few lessons about how to direct a big well, action scene with lots of special effects. It's a very well-made, professional, efficient movie, and it worked. And We liked it. We liked it. Okay, next movie. Have you ever been totally amazed by the way strange connections turn out between people and places that ought to have no connection at all. Well, Genghis Blues is a movie that travels about as far as you can possibly go, all the way to the obscure republic of Tuva, which is just a little outside of outer Mongolia. The movie begins with a blind blues singer from San Francisco named Paul Pena. One night, 15 years ago, while he was searching for stations on his shortwave radio, he heard a weird and wonderful sound. It was coming all the way from Tuva, and it was throat singing, a singing technique in which the throat is actually able to produce two different notes at the same time. And in some rather inexplicable way, I managed to figure out by the sound of what they were doing, what they were doing with their mouths to create that sound. 
Well, that's strange connection number one, Paul Pena and the shortwave radio. Connection number two is that the famous physicist Richard Feynman and his friend Ralph Layton, who was seen here, had always wanted to go to Tuva simply because it was so far away. So they founded the Friends of Tuva and eventually sent the blind blues man and his side men to Tuva for a throat singing competition. Do it, come on. Come on. There have been a lot of images symbolizing the brotherhood of man, but the sight of a blind blues singer from San Francisco, whose family comes from the Cape Verde Islands, participating in a Tuban throat singing competition, I think that more or less takes the cake. And it helps that Paul Pena is such a fascinating man, funny, gentle, with a sort of sad story of his own. Genghis Blues is one of those films that documentaries were invented for because no fiction film could possibly have dreamed up this wonderful story. I couldn't agree with you more. This was one of the most extraordinary things I'd ever seen, and it satisfied for me one of the real reasons I go to the movies, and that is to be a voyeur and be mm -hmm. taken into mm -hmm. a world I didn't know existed. Mm -hmm. And you're right, I could not have imagined. Of course, I happen to be an expert on tuban throat singing. Oh, really? I didn't well, realize I'd that. Actually, I'd actually heard an album of tuban throat singing, had never heard anything like it, and they can actually do two, three, and four notes. Uh -huh. He learns this himself, this and goes there, if this would be a remarkable accomplishment for anybody, and then when you think that he's blind on top of it and has other problems, which we find out about in the yeah. course of the film, yeah. it becomes it's, all the more remarkable. It's extraordinary. The only thing I would have liked was more tube and throat singing. I just wanted to hear more of it, especially that one guy who... Who uh, can really do it. And then, and then he goes and invents a whole other style of music right yeah. in the middle of the picture at the climactic moment. I know, yeah, it's, it's great. When we come back, my video pick of the week, three family films at special sale prices. Week is brought to you by Nestle's Raisinets. At the movies or at home, Raisinets. For my video picks this week, I'm thinking of parents who figure they might as well buy certain titles for their children instead of renting them because the kids, of course, want to watch them over and over and over and over again. Buying videos can be expensive, but here are three wonderful family films that are currently on sale at budget prices. Low price pick number one is The Boy Who Could Fly. Budget price pick number two, Babe, the original Babe, the enchanting story of a pig who thought it was a dog. Ruff, 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 ruff. <laughs> Move along there, you, you uh, big buttheads. <laughs> and my third low price family choice is Kiki's Delivery Service, the exciting animated film from Japan about a young witch who starts her own business. Let's go, Gigi. Excuse me, young lady. <gasps> All three of those titles are priced between $10 and $20, and you can find them at discounts up to 30%. That's cheaper than renting them a dozen times, and they're my video picks of the week. For many years, this program has advocated a reform of the MPAA rating system that would make it possible for adults in America to see movies exactly as their directors intended them to be seen. The R rating is too restrictive, and the NC-17 rating has become associated with hardcore pornography. I've suggested a new A rating to come between the R and the NC-17. It would mean adults only, but not pornography. Now the issue is in the news again because of the controversy over the editing of Stanley Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut. Both the Los Angeles and the New York Film Critics Associations have called for reform in the rating system, and Peter Bart, the influential editor of Variety, has joined the call for an overhaul, even agreeing that the A rating might be a good idea. If you wonder why the United States is the only major movie-going nation with no workable, practical adult film category, this might be a good time to write the MPAA and ask them. And I would agree that anything that would help us make the choices for ourselves about what we were going to see is a good idea. I like the idea of the ratings as an informational system, but not enforce it. I want to make the decision about what I'm going to see and what my child is going to see and not have that superseded by anybody else's so you're, authority. you're really a libertarian. Yes, in this case I am. Okay, now let's take another look at the movies we reviewed this week. Two thumbs down for A Runaway Bride, which combines the talents but not the magic of the Pretty Woman team. 
but we both had a lot of enthusiasm for The Iron Giant, a likable and smart animated film for the whole family. It opens next week. We had a disagreement, though, on Twin Falls, Idaho. Joyce didn't think she learned enough about the subject and the characters. I thought it was one of the year's best films. Joyce and I both had a good time at Deep Blue Sea, which is a well-made, effective thriller. And finally, we both love the wonderful Gingus Blues. And thanks a lot, Joyce, for being here. It was fun. I had a great time. I love the movies, and I know you do, too. Okay, thanks a lot. Remember, you can hear our reviews on the web at siskel-ebert.com, both Joyce and I. It's part of the Go Network. Next week, more new movies, including The Thomas Crown Affair and The Sixth Sense, a science fiction thriller starring Bruce Willis. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. For a limited time, save 25% off Meineke's lifetime mufflers, backed by a nationwide warranty. At Meineke, you won't pay a lot, but you'll get a lot. Urinary pain isn't going to stop you today. Uristat, from the makers of Monistat, relieves urinary pain until you can see your doctor. If you only use detergent, you're only doing half the job. You need Jet Dry. Hey, hey, look at that, huh? No spots, no film. Jet Dry, your dishwasher was designed for it. Nothing tastes like popcorn cooked in a pot on the stove. Except, mmm, new home-style microwave popcorn from Pop Secret. Closed captioning for Siskel and Ebert is brought to you by... 1-800-US-SEARCH. Locate a long-lost friend or family member. Find anyone. Call 1-800-US-SEARCH.